Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Let's Talk Manufacturing. We are up to episode number 15, if you are keeping score. And as always, I am your host, Rick Jenkins. Today, we're going to be talking about some big topics, including energy, broadband expansion, grid modernization, artificial intelligence, and data center overload. Like I said, that's some pretty big stuff. But here to help me with the conversation is Donda Bishop. Donda is the vice president of energy at AFL. AFL is located in Duncan, and they are a global manufacturer of fiber optic products and equipment. Donda, welcome to the ship. Hi, Rick. Thank you. It is good to have you here. I'm glad you came. I have somebody uh, from AFL on the show from time to time, and it's always a good conversation. Mark Bullock, uh, uh, president of Product Solutions, joined me not too long ago, and you told me just a bit ago that Mark is your boss. Uh, Mark, great guy, and and uh, we'll talk about uh, our con the conversation that I had with Mark here in a little bit. I want to get into a couple of things, but first, Donda, let's talk about you. You have been in AFL for, what, 30 years? 30 years. So it was my first gig out of college, and I think it's going to stick. Uh, probably. So far. You're probably used to it by now. Yeah, I'm figuring out what exactly what it is I'm supposed to be doing, but yeah. that changes on a daily basis. I'm so, sure. yeah, I'm an EE out of Clemson, and um, don't exactly know what took me down the EE path, but uh, was glad that I did. It created opportunities at AFL. Now, EE, just to make uh, sure. Electrical, electrical engineer. That's yep. right, okay. So, non traditional career path for most women, particularly 30 years ago, uh, but heavy in math and something that seems challenging. And so I said, let's go for that. I don't know why the the good Lord makes you pick your career path when you're absolutely at your dumbest in high school. But I think that's a that's a challenge for us is to uh, to figure out how do, you, how do you want to spend the rest of your life. And so thankfully made a good choice there. And um, first job out of college was uh, an associate process engineer at AFL. Yeah. And uh, that was sort of the door opener for me some 30 years ago. You know, I bet you're right. I didn't think about it, but I, I don't know what percentage of engineers are women. But I have a feeling it's the minority. Mm -hmm. And 30 years ago, I bet it really was. How many electrical engineering uh, counterparts were you studying I, with at moment? <laughs> I probably had, I was probably one of maybe two uh -huh. in the classroom. Wow. Yes. Yeah. So, how about that? So, it was now look where you are now, 30 yeah. year career with AFL, huge, huge company. And now let's talk about AFL for a second. Sure. Now, they are out in. Uh, Duncan? Duncan headquarters are in Duncan, South Carolina. Right. And I don't know why I hesitated because I've been there 15 times, but nonetheless, they are out there in Duncan. Give us, uh, for those who may not be aware, a little elevator speech on uh, AFL. So AFL is a manufacturer of products and services to the telecommunications industry. So all things telecom except for the, the laser sources. So anything that you might need as a, a utility to build an, a telecom infrastructure as a carrier, to build your telecom infrastructure uh, from a data center, all of the blinky lights and cables inside of that, we do all of that. So any, any type of network, uh, we would supply all of the pieces and parts that would go into that. Got it. And you run the energy business unit. That's right. At AFL. Now you have three units? Three business units. Yep. One is uh, mine around energy. Uh, I have a counterpart in data center, yeah. and I have a counterpart in broadband. Right. Well, uh, you all have to be completely connected in many, many different ways, the three different business units. And we're going to talk about that because, um, uh, you know, as I think about grid modernization and I think about uh, how important it is for us to continue uh, to expand our data centers, uh, it seems like it would just, uh, you all are going to have to work together constantly to be able to it is definitely, yeah. it's, we're definitely sitting at a position where um, the intersection, if you will, of energy and broadband and hyperscale slash data center is so obvious. Like we, one drives the other, pushes the other. So they're very interconnected. Um, we have a great group. Um, this new structure was just formed up in April of this year. Prior to that, we were products-based business units. Now we're market-facing business units. So that's been fun for us to align as le new leaders of these business units under Mark Bolick uh, and to, to, to figure out how we harness the goodness that is happening in our space with the drivers from data centers and the demand for energy. Uh, clearly the drivers for connectivity between those data centers to talk to each other uh, and how, these, how they 
feed in term, each other in terms of demand and opportunities for us. All right, I mentioned that I talked to Mark Bullock a while back. And as I said, Mark and I were in here, we talked about a whole lot of things, but we were talking about the demand for data as I reach into my pocket and pull out my phone. You only have one phone. Oh, uh, yes, I do. I only have one phone, and it's actually Some quite... Some people have two. I, I know that. I know. I do have an iPad that I can't live without. But Mark was talking about the demand that, uh, well, the, the demand that comes from us at the consumer is a ridiculous high amount, and it keeps getting more. We keep demanding more. Not only do we demand more, but we demand to get it faster mm -hmm. and faster and faster. Yeah. And what that means is, is that the data centers have to keep up. And in order to ensure that the data center centers keep up, there are a lot of things that have to happen. And now that's what I want to talk about. One thing that has to happen is grid modernization. Mm -hmm. Explain it to me and how does it happen? So grid modernization is a, is a term that means different things to different people. There's no one definition. You ask me, how can I say that with authority? Because we went and asked our customers over 60 voice of customer in, um, interviews that we conducted, and there's not one overarching definition of grid modernization. It kind of depends on who you are and where you are in your journey. But how I define grid modernization is the investments that enable sufficient capacity to meet the demand, uh, reliably, um, protected from attacks, whether they be physical, cyber, electromagnetic field attacks, or other attacks, um, and the ability to recover power if there were to be an incident, all safely, mm -hmm. protecting citizens as well as the power utility okay. um, employees. So that's what grid modernization is. Okay. Now I'm going to come back to that in a minute, but let's go to broadband mm -hmm. expansion. Mm -hmm. And these things are all tied together, but talk about that for a sec. So broadband expansion's been something that has been, I'd say, funded in some form or fashion for probably the last decade. And it's talking about taking um, high-speed internet to consumers all over the, for the U.S. and the country. Um, it started as a push towards rural America. Um, there were initiatives in the late, um, you know, 2015 to 2020 timeframe that were intended to make high-speed internet more accessible to people that were in, not in metropolitan areas. Mm -hmm. And I'd say COVID really amplified the need for that to be the case with medicine, right. telemedicine and work from home and all of those things were really like, they just shone a spotlight on the fact that this is technology and capability we really can't live without. It's not a nice to have, it's a must have. Mm -hmm. So fast forward to today and the, um, uh, some of the initiatives that were put into place by the Biden administration that really haven't come to fruition yet, but they're out there in terms of funding that could could proliferate broadband expansion into the all parts of the U.S. The money is there. It just hasn't been spent yet. But it, I think it has moved from uh, something that we would like to have in all parts of the country to you go somewhere and you can't get connectivity on your phone and you're immediately irritated and you feel like I can't get my email and I can't talk to my family and all those things have that it has grown to the point where it has to happen now. Couple that with the fact that broadband connectivity between the data center owners, like their own facilities, need to be connected with broadband capability. And we talk broadband, it's just high speed and inter interconnects. Um, that capability has to extend to the data centers as well. So we as consumers um, count on our phones to and our laptops to work. Um, that interconnectivity with to the home are also between the grids that that hold the the computing power all of that interconnectivity has to has to either be built or is being built to make that infrastructure robust and you need fiber optic cable and you need we fiber love. optic cable and you need fiber optic cable yes and that is what AFL does I have seen those cables out there you know that are that big around mm -hmm. they have Thousands, thousands and thousands of fiber optic right. cables within the cable. That's right. Right. And uh, so, so let's just talk about that a little bit. How does AFL, um, what do they do to make all of this happen? I mean, from your all's perspective, what is your all's part in this? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I'd say we sit at a, at a really, from my stand, standpoint, from the energy space, we are um, serving the utilities who are trying to feed the power to these data centers. So that's sort of a, the unique 
uh, aspect and, and viewpoint that, that my role has and that my team has. The data center space, so my counterpart um, there is trying to service that group with enough fiber to feed the demand. So got me trying to serve up the power, right, to the, serve in the electric utilities. Like they need to build the infrastructure to serve the power. So maybe a little nugget of insight. Data centers um, size themselves by how much power they will consume. Not how many square feet the building is, not how many terabytes of data that they will consume, but how much power they will consume. So how many megawatts or gigawatts of power a data center site will use to, to make all those blinky lights do their thing. Right. So for us, our electric utility customers who are the, the foundation of our, of our company, really that's where the company started, they're the ones with the struggle right now of how do I serve up enough power to these data center customers? The data center customers are gonna go where they can get land and where they can get power. And so the utilities are really struggling after two decades of not growing. Um, you know, we came through a season of um, do everything you can to be more efficient with your energy utilization, like don't use energy, to, oh my goodness, now we're punching the gas for we need to build generation capacity, we need to build new transmission lines, we need to build substations, all to serve up this demand for information, AI and machine learning data, which is housed inside of these data centers. So from my perspective, this creates a wonderful opportunity for our energy business to help our energy customers, the utilities, the investor-owned utilities, electric co-ops, public power, municipal power, government agencies like TBA, how they are responding to the demands for these data centers. So my perspective is, how can I help the utilities build more capacity faster? Dante, you just men, uh, mentioned AI, artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. which uh, we never, quite literally, never get through a show, whether it's law, less talk business or less talk manufacturing, without talking about artificial intelligence. So let's talk about that for a second. Is it as impactful in your industry as it has been in every other one. It is the most impactful element of our industry right now because it is driving the demand for data centers and um, compute capacity. Uh, so as data centers, we have an entire business unit who is singularly focused on how do we service the data centers, right? And that's from an optical connectivity standpoint. So while those data centers are being built to do what? Have compute power for what? AI and machine learning. My business unit is going, hey, how can we help the utilities frame up the, the, um, the power supply for those data centers? So at the heart of all of this is the need for data and the compute power for the data. I have read stories about how much energy and power it takes to fulfill the demand that people have every day sitting at their computers, sitting uh, and, and using chat GPT and pulling, you know, and all, all of those types of things like chat GPT. Mm -hmm. It is amazing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how much it is. Mm -hmm. I don't see how you keep up. And then once you, once you are keeping up, it's not going to be very long before it increases again. Yeah. Constant battle. Yes. Yes. You're, you're a hundred percent. So we're in the, the build phase of this initial launch, if you will, of AI and machine learning capability. But who's to say that your thirst for information and compute knowledge is going to, to subside? Probably no one would say that. So right. we're going to build it, and then who knows? Build it again, right? So, um, so this is, uh, you know, five years ago, probably none of us would have predicted that the, right. that the growth that we're seeing in the energy space, driven by uh, on the demands of the data center compute power, no one would have predicted that. So here we are. Um, now we're trying to predict when, when's that next, either inflection point or tail off. Um, get your crystal ball out because that's what, that's, right. you know, it's anybody's guess. But I'd say the, the quest uh, for data from mankind is not, is not declining. Like we want more and more information. That's right. Yeah. I'm going to ask you, as difficult as it is, I'm going to ask you to look into your crystal ball. It's hazy, always uh, hazy. It is completely hazy, but there's no way for us to know what's going to happen, I think, literally six, eight months from now. Uh, but I'm still going to ask you to take a stab at it. We're going to look five years down the road. How are things going to be different than they are right now? You're going into your 35th year at that point. Holy moly. AFL, holy moly. And uh, what's going to be different? 
So I think the, the thing that I can count on, what won't be different, is that our electric utilities um, will be certainly growing, still investing. Uh, for us, that is a, a mainstay of our business. I think the data centers, if we, um, if we continue to think that mankind wants more and more information, I think the big part of the build out will hopefully be done by that point. There's just a, it's a, we call that an arms race right now for who's gonna get to the most capability, the fastest. So I think we'll have cleared that hurdle. Hopefully the US is gonna win that race. Uh, and then we'll figure out how we, what's the next great thing? Like how are we gonna replace that capability, upscale that capability? Uh, expand it uh, to the next thing. So I, I think for the utilities, they've always been sort of a blue chip stock, right? You could just always count on the steadily return. And what has changed now is that they're at the forefront of this thing, like the gating factor in some regard for how fast that these data centers can be built. So we really want them to, to continue to invest the kegers on, on some of those sections of the utility market are double digits, right? So there's a lot of growth that needs to happen and you don't just build new infrastructure from an electrical transmission standpoint overnight. So that's gonna take some time. Um, and meanwhile, the data centers are gonna to continue to grow. And let's say that there's a, a new technology that emerges in the next five to 10 years. I, for one, am ready for Beam Me Up, Scotty, to be a reality. So I, I'm really, I'm, I'm championing for someone to figure that out so we don't have to get an aluminum capsule to go halfway around the world, right? Oh, that's so nice. It'll be so fun. Donda, I'm gonna get you out of here on this. You mentioned that when you were in college, you were only one of one or two young women sitting in a classroom learning about electrical engineering and then you eventually of course go into manufacturing manufacturing although getting better is not an industry that has had a lot of women enter it uh, uh, they are the minority but you did it and you've had great success mm -hmm. how about some advice for young women who may be considering going into the industry sure um i love the question so first of all, engineering for women is, um, people say, well, I don't know what to focus on. Focus on, you know, I say focus on engineering because you can go anywhere with engineering. It teaches you how to solve problems. So if you're, if you're curious about what path to go on, and then in terms of manufacturing, uh, at 23, 24, I didn't know what, you know, what, what I was getting myself into. Right. Um, but it created a wonderful platform and a multitude of opportunities. So it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be the traditional way of going for women. It can be, and, and manufacturing is always evolving. Either you're changing or you're dying, so right. you're never gonna get bored in the space. Um, and one bit of advice to anybody is, um, be willing to raise your hand and say, I don't exactly know what I'm signing up for, but I'm gonna do that. And you'll be surprised at, at the doors that can open from that. Not a good stuff. Awesome. I appreciate Thank you, Rick. You. Thank you. Good time. Thank uh, you. It is a good time. Folks, that is a smart executive right there. That is Donda Bishop. She is the vice president of the Energy Business Unit at AFL. And that concludes another episode of Let's Talk Manufacturing South Carolina. I appreciate you joining us. We'll see you next time.